There is a uh, Spanish story of a father and son who became estranged. The son ran away and the father set off to find him. He searched for months to no avail. Finally, in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in a Madrid newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up <laughs> looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. Hungry for love and forgiveness, that's a lot of Pacos, which serves us with much food for thought. The scribes and Pharisees were grumbling about Jesus, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus responded by telling them the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost son, showing that lost people matter to God, that in his love and forgiveness, God wants people to be restored in their relationship with him. An interesting fact that I learned recently is that while we in America call tow trucks wreckers, in England these kinds of trucks are called recovery vehicles. The trucks have the word recovery stenciled on them. While we say the wrecker is coming, the English say, here comes recovery. God seeks the recovery of wrecked lives. In God's love and forgiveness, lost people matter to God. The parable of the lost son is also known as the prodigal son or the loving father. And if you haven't heard it said before, prodigal means recklessly wasteful. Recklessly wasteful in reference to what the son did in the parable with his money. It does not mean returning after a long absence. It does not mean returning after a long absence. So let's take a closer look at this prodigal son in the parable. As the younger of the two sons, he would have been entitled to one-third of his father's estate upon his father's death. What the younger son did, though, was to ask for his inheritance while his father was still living, which in essence is saying, I wish you were dead so I could have my inheritance. And for whatever reason the son made this request, his father handed over his inheritance. His share of the estate would have been in the form of land and livestock, so the son sold it all and turned it into cash. This was really another slap in the face to his father because selling this family land constituted selling part of the family's heritage, part of their identity, and the security for the future by taking away what the father would need later in life. Probably with no intention of returning home, the son gathered everything together and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate with loose living. He was recklessly wasteful with his money, a prodigal, spending everything he had on a wild time. Using the illustration of the winnowing process, it has been explained that the prodigal son literally blew it on wild, riotous living. In the winnowing process, harvested grain from the fields was brought in and placed on a threshing floor. Animals such as oxen were led around and around over the grain, or the grain was beaten to press the grain kernels from the husks. On a windy day, the farmer would use a wooden paddle to toss the grain up into the air. The wind would blow the lighter husks away, and the heavier grain would fall back onto the floor. Repeating this process numerous times, the husks were soon all blown away, and the grain was all that was left on the threshing floor. The wind being used to blow the husks away is why it is called winnowing. So in the same manner, with his money, the sun really blew it. It was like sending it into the wind. 
So left with nothing and a famine occurring at the same time in that country, the son became very desperate. So he hired himself out to someone who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs, which for a Jew was one of the lowest possible humiliations. Ironically, he ended up with the pigs after going hog wild himself. In extreme hunger, the son wished he could eat what the pigs were eating, carob tree pods, but the pods are not edible for humans. All he could do was eye what they were eating, which you could say was an early form then of the iPod. (laughs) Wallowing in misery, the son came to his senses and thought about home where even his father's hired servants had plenty to eat. Then he made a plan to go home and to confess to his father that he did indeed blow it that he had sinned against his father and against God, that he was no longer worthy to be called his son and to request to make him one of his father's hired servants. So he set out for home with this plan in mind. While he's still a long way off, his father saw him coming home. And we can imagine the father going out every single day to the road and looking down the road to see if his son was coming back. And finally... That day came for that patient, faithful, loving father. He felt compassion for his son and ran to meet him and embracing him and kissing him. And the embrace and the kiss were signs of acceptance and friendship. The son began his rehearsed speech, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father called for the servants to bring a robe a robe standing for honor and a ring standing for authority and shoes standing for a son as opposed to a slave. The son was not disowned. He probably didn't have a chance to finish his rehearsed lines, which included, make me as one of your hired men. The father also instructed the servants to prepare the meat that was reserved for eating at big celebrations. The father wanted to have a celebration. For this son of mine was dead and has come back to life again. He was lost and he's been found. So this was reason to celebrate. But when the older son came in from the field and heard the party going on and found out the reason for the party, he wasn't in a celebratory mood. As a matter of fact, he was angry so angry that he wouldn't step foot into the party. In a self-righteous attitude and in contrast to his father's compassion, he accused his father of never giving him such a celebration. Having been obedient to his father over the years, he was angry that there was a celebration for his disobedient brother who came home after he wasted part of the family's estate. In his eyes, his brother didn't deserve anything. No rejoicing, no rejoicing that he was back, no compassion, no forgiveness, no second chance, nothing. In his father's eyes, it was necessary to rejoice over the return of his lost son to give him what he did not deserve, love and forgiveness. Can we identify with either of the sons in this parable? Have we ever run off from our Heavenly Father to do our own thing, to pursue our own pleasures, our own agenda? Have we ever had the consequences of our sin bring us to the point of hitting rock bottom? Surely there are those of us here today who can identify with the prodigal son, those of us who know the painful consequences of sin, who know what it means to come to our senses and and long for home, who desire our Heavenly Father's love and forgiveness. No matter how badly we mess up, our loving, merciful, compassionate Heavenly Father wants us to return to Him and to receive forgiveness. On the other hand, it's fairly easy to sympathize with the older son. He had been the good, obedient, dutiful one 
who was to stand back and watch as the wasteful, disobedient partier gets welcomed home with open arms. Now, how unfair is that? However, Jesus told this parable to the grumbling scribes and Pharisees who reveled in their own righteousness and resented others for receiving anything they felt others didn't deserve. The loving Father in the parable is the illustration of God who not only forgives but wants us to forgive others as well. The parable does not continue to let us know what the older son did after his father said, but we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost, but now is found. Considering his attitude and words and actions, we would imagine it would have been very difficult for the older son to forgive and to forget. Placing ourselves in his sandals, could we? Corey Tenboom told of not being able to forget a wrong that had been done to her. She had forgiven the person, but she kept rehashing the incident, and so she couldn't sleep. Finally, Corey cried out to God for help in putting the problem to rest. God's help came in the form of a kindly Lutheran pastor, Corey wrote, to whom I confessed my failure after two sleepless weeks. Up in the church tower, he said, nodding out the window, is a bell which is rung by pulling on a rope. But you know what? After the sexton lets go of the rope, the bell keeps swinging. First ding and then dong. Slower and slower until there's a final dong and it stops. I believe the same thing is true of forgiveness. When we forgive, we take our hand off the rope. But if we've been tugging at our grievances for a long time, we mustn't be surprised if the old angry thoughts keep coming for a while. They're just the dings and the dongs of the old bell slowing down. And so it proved to be. There were a few more midnight reverberations, a couple of dings when the subject came up in my conversations. But the force, which was my willingness in the matter, had gone out of them. They came less and less often and at last stopped altogether. Do we suppose the older brother could have come to forgive and to forget? Learning from the parable of the lost son, we can know that lost people matter to God. And there is great rejoicing when lost people are found. We can know however badly we mess up, when we return to God, we can receive forgiveness. We can know that prideful and resentful attitudes are not in line with our loving and forgiving Heavenly Father. We can know that we are to forgive others just as God has forgiven us in Jesus. Forgiveness should always ring a bell with us so we can, as Paul said, lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. We can know that in Jesus we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Receive forgiveness. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you so much for the forgiveness that we have through him. And pray, Lord, that we can learn from your word and apply your word to our daily lives so that we can receive forgiveness and also forgive others. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.